River. A narrow canal in the Javari Valley. It is harsh territory, full of caimans and poisonous snakes, where numerous jaguars still roam and where malaria and yellow fever have become an accepted part of the life cycle. The ability to see the future and talk with animals is fairly common among the Matsis. Add to this the fact that they are mostly hunters, it is not surprising then that they see the jaguar as the most powerful among the spirit hierarchy. They are witnesses too and have immense admiration for the animal's strength, cunning and hunting ability. Consequently, they adorn their face with tattoos that are reminiscent of the jaguar's facial expressions. This tattoo is the symbol of their identity as Matses and their source of pride. Men wear long palm sticks attached to their upper lip to represent the jaguar's whiskers. The women, instead, wear them in their nose and lower lip. By physically resembling a jaguar, they believe they can incorporate its spirit. They also paint their body and face with uraku, drawing thick stripes on their forehead and around their eyes to ensure invisibility and guarantee acute vision. The Matses firmly believe that all those who hunt indiscriminately will sooner or later end up with no prey at all. Frequent hunting means conversing with the animals, asking them to allow themselves to be captured and then be killed and eaten. The forest is, in spite of its perils, the Matses' main ally in their fight for survival. Their most common prey are birds of various species, monkeys and rodents, hunted after endless hours of tracking and stalking, with perfect imitations of the animal call signals. Usually, small game adequately rounds out the diet in terms of basic protein requirement, which is always guaranteed by hunting and fishing. Adults and children alike pay great attention to their personal hygiene and during those moments when they are resting they often dedicate time and effort to the task of grooming themselves. Because they live in such direct contact with a free environment which is also full of potential danger they are vulnerable to diseases transmitted by parasites and meniscal insects called Biushimpi. Now, Pablo and his sons are preparing for a hunt, which will last several days, and therefore they will need the sapo. The term sapo refers to both the large tree frog by that name and to the drug with its multiple connotations. To collect the sapo, the matses catch the frog at night. The amphibian is easy to recognize as it does not croak like all other frogs, but rather emits a guttural sound similar to a dog's bark. It is handled very gently and kept captive for three days.
During this time, the frog is tied down and its back is scraped gently with a small stick. The sapo that is collected is then used to coat a flat piece of wood and, if properly preserved, will last for over a year. Given the frequency with which this drug is used, however, the sapo never lasts that long. As I observe these images, I think of how ancient and primordial their culture is and how it reached the present era unchanged, in spite of the contact with missionaries who brought well-being but also disorder to their thoughts. Just as the sunset begins to colour the sky with its fiery hue, the hunters look for a suitable spot at the edge of the forest and begin the sap or ritual. They first scrape some of the resin from the stick and add some saliva to thin it. Next, they use the tip of an ember-hot tree branch and burn a spot on their skin. The burnt skin is removed and the liquefied sapo applied to the wound. The size of the burn rarely exceeds the dimension of a match head, but the effect is staggering. From the instant in which the drug comes into contact with the skin, the body begins to heat up. In just a few moments, the feeling is one of burning inside and the whole body begins to sweat. The pulse accelerates and the heart hammers furiously. One can feel every artery and vein in the body open up to allow for the rapid flow of blood. One loses control over all bodily functions to the point of defecating, crying and drooling helplessly. The throbbing drumbeat of the blood coursing through the body drowns out all other sounds. The pain is so great as to be intolerable and makes one wish for death. Finally, there are cramps to the stomach and one vomits violently. Then, from total exhaustion, one falls to the ground unconscious. Upon reawakening, the feeling of strength is explosive. It will be possible to go without food, running for days and days in the jungle without ever feeling tired. Everything will seem larger than life and better than normal. It will be possible to see perfectly in the dark because all the senses and physical strength are heightened to an extreme extent. This life of theirs is still rich and savage in a raw sense. But as they learn another language or gradually take possession of objects that cannot be traced to their natural environment, they seem to be losing the ability to communicate with the spirits based on a real need. Will Pablo continue to have good fortune in hunting as he has in the past? One can only hope that the impact with civilization and white society won't be brutal and destructive, but that his people will be at least given the space and the time to adapt and make that 3,000 year leap without falling into the abyss. For this is the magnitude of the divide that separates their cultures from ours, fascinated by the natural quality, the beauty, and the harmony lost to us, but which still exists in this world down here, in the heart of the Amazon forest. I take with me these last images of life, all too soon perhaps only a fading memory, the illusion of Eden.